Chairs Now Waiting, episode number 601, Trey Meets Andy. Two Chairs No Waiting is brought to you each week by the folks over at WeaversDepartmentStore.com. Drop by over at Weavers. It's October, so it's time to head over and get our old man rimshaw print. That's right. If you don't have one, you need one. The eyes will follow you around all over the house, so be careful. Christmas is coming up, too, so you may want to go check out the Christmas ornaments they have now. Wooden Christmas ornaments with kerosene cucumbers, ho, 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 Mayberry Christmas, the Mayberry Trocar emblem, and a Two Chairs No Waiting ornament. And we also got new hats as well. So head over to WeaversDepartmentStore.com and check it out. Two Chairs No Waiting is also brought to you by donations from listeners just like you. So our executive producer tonight is not really a donator, but he is allowing us to use his story. So Trey Miller. Trey Miller is our executive producer for episode 601. Hello, everybody. I'm Alan Newsom, your host for Two Chairs No Waiting. It is always great to be here in Mayberry with you. And uh, this is no exception. This past weekend was the 60th anniversary of the Andy Griffith Show. Now, we talked about it a little bit last week and brought it up that, you know, hey, it's the 60th anniversary. This week on MeTV, they're showing a kind of a Mayberry mini marathon. Every night they're showing episodes of the Andy Griffith Show just to get uh, everything going and keep it going well. Uh, I don't know if TV Land's doing it as well, but uh, there's lots of Mayberry going on in and around uh, the uh, the internet and uh, everywhere. So, uh, and as part of that, uh, um, we I found this story about Trey meeting Andy. Now, back on episode number one hundred and three of Two Chairs No Waiting. Now that was from September twenty eighth, two thousand and ten. Ten years ago. Uh, it was called Andy Griffith Statue Part 4. A young man had called into the show uh, and left a voicemail about meeting Andy Griffith. It's about the eight-minute mark into that episode, if you'd like to go hear it. Uh, and that was to help us celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Andy Griffith Show. Well, that young fellow's name uh, is Trey Miller. And he's still young, but not as young, because it's been 10 years. And here we are on the 60th anniversary or at least right after it, of the Andy Griffith Show. And, and, and Trey released a special episode of a video blog that he does. It's called Globe Trotting with Trey over on YouTube. There'll be links to that in our show notes. But if you go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash Trey meets Andy, you can listen to this entire uh, story that he gives. It's most of it we're fixing to listen to right here on the podcast because Trey was kind enough to give me permission to be able to share it with you here on Two Chairs because he told this story 10 years ago and I've never forgotten about it. So when I saw his Globe Trotting with Trey episode where he talked about it even in more depth, uh, yeah, I remembered it. So I reached out and contacted him and said, hey, could, could we tell this story again? on two chairs and share it with that audience. And he said, sure, sure. So uh, I definitely want to encourage you to go and visit his site there. If you, if you Google it, by the way, if you just Google globe trotting with Trey, it's T R E Y, you'll find it, but links will be in our show note for it. Uh, But listen to this story because I know as I listen to it as a fan of Andy Griffith, you know, I was excited (laughs) listening to Trey tell this story. Because I could just imagine myself being there and being part of it. So let's go on and hear Trey, and we'll talk about it a little bit more after it's over. And we'll hear from Randy Turner with this week in Mayberry history. So Trey, take it away. So how I'm going to honor this, I'm going to tell you a really cool story that happened to me. And um, it took place in 2009. I was in college. I was sitting bored in one of my classes. I can see myself now sitting there at my desk. So I get on my phone. We had the uh, the phones then where, of course, you could get on the Internet. So uh, I was lucky at that point in my life. So I got in there and I typed uh, Andy Griffith. I would put it in a Yahoo search and just see, you know, if there was any news about Andy Griffith because I hadn't searched in a while. So I get on there and I search Andy Griffith and an article popped up and it says, The Sheriff of Mayberry is heading to Raleigh, North Carolina this weekend. 
So I click on the article and Andy Griffith was going to be at Bev Purdue, the North Carolina governor that was sworn in there in 2009. He was going to be at her ceremony, her uh, uh, inauguration ceremony that coming we uh, weekend. I think I was looking at this on a Wednesday or a Thursday. He was going to be there on a Saturday, a part of the ceremony in Raleigh, North Carolina. So I had always said if I ever had an opportunity to be somewhere where Andy Griffith was performing or appearing or something, I was going to take that opportunity. So I uh, decided I'm going to drive to Raleigh, North Carolina. Now from where I lived at, it was seven and a half hours. So I'd already had a plan, plan for a, a date with my girlfriend that Saturday night. So I continued with the date, dropped her off later on at her house, and uh, I went back to my home. And I remember I took like a 30-minute nap. And I was so excited, I really couldn't sleep. So I got up, got in the car, drove seven and a half hours to Raleigh, North Carolina. I get into Raleigh probably about 4.30 in that morning. <laughs> Nothing was open. I go out to where the Capitol building was, where the ceremony was going to be, and no one is there. So I said, well, man, I'm going to sit in the front row. <laughs> the first one here. So I go to a Waffle House so I could kind of just regroup because I was tired at this point. Hadn't slept yet. And uh, it was the only thing open, like I said. So I go in there and sit for probably about an hour. And it was a cold day that day. I mean, I'm talking about 25 degrees. It was, it was cold in North Carolina. So I go back out to the uh, Capitol building, and now another little crowd has come. Has come. Um, before I get to that part, bef when I first got out there, probably about after I left Waffle House, I went back out there, and I was still the only person there. And a news uh, person came over to me and said, hey, are you um, already here for the ceremony? I said, yes, I am. And I said, well, hey, can we interview? Of course. And I told them that i just driven all the way from Alabama because I'm a big fan of Andy Griffith. And uh, they, they couldn't believe it. So they put me on the news. Uh, I think they said something about a, a young guy drove all the way from Alabama, not to see the governor, but to see Andy Griffith. Yeah, that was me. That was Trey. Glow trotting with Trey. I didn't have a show then, but I was glow trotting even in 2009. But anyway, so the ceremony comes. I have a really great seat. I'm sitting there, and I hear two people talking about, hey, before I left, I heard them say that some guy from Alabama drove here because he was a fan of Andy. And I had already told the person next to me, and they were like, yeah, and here he is. So, you know, I had all these people wanting to hear my story. I make the newspaper the next day. They quoted me in the paper. I was 20 years old, 21, 22, whatever, and they put me in the paper and everything, so that was pretty cool. But anyway, Andy came on stage. He read his poem. I'm going to play it for you right now. This is what Andy said there on that cold morning in North Carolina. Carolina is my home. I no longer have to roam. When I see our morning sun, I know there's work to be done. Governor Bev Perdue, is the person we choose because there's so much she can do. She will need our best to achieve her quest, to be the person we need so we may succeed. Please grant us the peace to allow her to lead. God bless her and keep her and always be near her as she opens a door as never before. So as the new year starts, let us open our hearts as I trot out again to say hello to my friends. Nicholas. Our grand, I know that all will be great for our grand old North State. Thank you. So I was right there and I got to hear Andy say that poem. And it was just so cool to actually be in front of him and see him live because I've seen him on television my whole life. And there was the Sheriff of Mayberry right in front of me here on earth with me. You know, it was, that was just such a cool experience. Just probably like how you saw Elvis. I mean, he was right there. You know, so after the ceremony, I knew that Andy had to leave somehow. So I go around to the back of the, to the side of the Capitol. That's where the governor and all his crowd was. So I said, nah, Andy's not leaving that way. So I go in the back of the building and I, I just wait back there at the back of the building. Yeah, probably like a stalker, but I wasn't a stalker. I was just a young guy that wanted to meet Andy. 
but I was the only person back there, luckily. So I probably waited probably uh, 10 minutes, maybe, probably not even that, maybe 15, I don't know. But I remember I was just standing there thinking, man, has he already left, you know? Did I miss my, my chance? I drove seven and a half hours. The doors open and about five or six people come out. And I noticed they were taking a guy out in a wheelchair. Andy was in the wheelchair. So I said, oh man, this is my opportunity. His car was parked right there. I had heard that Andy wasn't as friendly as, you know, his characters are on television to his fans. I just heard he was a very, you know, Andy was a, Griffith was a very private person. You didn't really see him much, didn't, you know, hear much about him. So I didn't want to go up to Andy and my whole, <laughs> my whole childhood of being a big fan just ruined just like that because he, he told me to get lost or something like that. So I go over to his wife. It, it was really sad because I about had to help Andy get in the car because he was very feeble at this point in his life. And it, it made me sad because of loving the guy like I did. You know, seeing him at this time of his life where he's not that young, vibrant, energetic guy in that sheriff's suit anymore. You know, he's here toward the end of life and he has trouble getting in and out of a car. You know, so that hurt me, you know, seeing him like that. But hey, that's life, I guess. But anyhow, I, I approach his wife and I tell her who I am and that I came all the way from Alabama, Miss Griffith, to, to meet your husband. Is there any way that I could say hello to him and shake his hand? And they took me right over to Andy, sitting in, his, in the passenger side in the front of the car. I had a little camera. And um, I'm going to show you the camera. Actually, I see it right here. So I had a little camera, this camera right here, that I brought with me and that took pictures that day. And um, so when they were taking me over to the car to meet Andy, I asked the guy, I said, hey, man, you think that you could um, take a picture of me? Because I know no one would ever believe this story. And he was like, no, I, I don't think I can do that. So I let it go. They introduced me to Mr. Griffith, but before they introduced me, the guy said, here, go ahead and let me have that camera. So I give him this camera, and I'm thinking, man, I'm going to have pictures and everything. So they introduced me to Mr. Griffith. I remember the guy said, hey, uh, uh, Mr. Griffith, uh, this guy here drove all the way from Alabama because he's a big fan of yours. And, I, man, I'll tell you at this point, I can take myself right now as I tell this story and feel what I felt. Andy looked up to me, I remember he looked up at me, and he had that smile on his face like he has on the Andy, Andy Griffith show. And uh, I know what I said to him. My heart was pounding. I'm telling you, my heart was beating. I, w I was nervous. I got nervous because I was looking into his eyes. And I said, hey, Mr. Griffith, I just want to tell you thank you. I remember I said thank you for all the entertainment that you have provided me. When I was a little kid and the Andy Griffith show would come on television, I would put on my Andy, uh, my Sheriff of Mayberry uniform. I had one made for me. And I would be the Sheriff of Mayberry. And then I said, Mr. Griffith, when your Andy Griffith show would go off, Matlock would come on and I would go put on my best Sunday suit with a tie and I would become Matlock. And that's, how, that's what I did, and I, they laughed when I said that. And I told him, I just want to thank you for all the entertainment that um, you provided me. I'm a big fan. And he thanked me. And that was pretty much it. He shook my hand, and he thanked me. And the guy gave me my camera back. And Andy and them went right down the road there at the back of the Capitol building there in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I got my camera to look at the picture. And let me tell you, the most important picture of this camera's life, he and Michael Jordan probably, <laughs> this lens froze just like that. And all you can see is the top of my head in Andy's car, which I'm showing you, showing you now on the screen. Yes, you camera let me down. And I don't have a picture with Andy Griffith. Come on, man. Panasonic, Panasonic uh, uh, Lumix, Lumix, it's a Lumix camera. You let me down. I mean, you've, you did a lot of good for me, but he let me down in that moment. But anyway, I still was happy because I shook his hand and I, Andy Griffith knew I existed in this world. 
And I hope that he left that day thinking like, wow, that, how, how old was that guy? 19, 20, 18? He drove all the way from Alabama to meet me. Wow. And Andy's in his 80s. So I hope that he felt like, well, my life meant something, which I know he surely did. But my life must have meant something, some young guy, you know, as a fan. And I think, hey, that is, you know, I, I hope I could be 80 and some 20-year-old be like, man, I admire your work. You know, you're, you're awesome. I mean, I, that would be a cool thing to, to have. But I drove all the way home. I make it to South Carolina, and I have to go to sleep. So I find a mall, and I just probably sleep for three hours. And I had borrowed my parents, my dad's uh, Yukon, without them knowing that I was going to uh, Raleigh, North Carolina then. But uh, anyhow, some things are best, uh, best left not asking for permission, right? But uh, I went to, uh, to Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm at Andy Griffith, and I have this story to share on Glow Trotting with Trey. So today is 60 years, and Andy, his work still exists. He will always exist in Mayberry. He will always be that lawyer on Matlock. And to me, I'll always be a big fan. So if you want to celebrate, go watch your favorite Andy Griffith episode today. <laughs> if you want some laughter, today's crazy world, just put Andy in. He'll make it all better. Uh, thank you, Trey. And yes, he will make it all better. And what an amazing story. I remember the story from 10 years ago when he just left me a voicemail telling this story. And I played it here on the podcast in episode number 103. You guys can go back and hear the shorter version there. Or you can head over to see uh, at Globetrotting with Trey. And you can hear the entire story. The link to his uh, to that particular video is on the podcast show notes it'll be in the show notes as well as globe trotting with trey now what trey usually does is he does uh, videos about elvis things about elvis but he's also he told me he's going to start doing some more things about andy uh, so uh, i look forward to seeing some of his great content great story trey i'm so happy you got to experience that and so sad that your camera messed up uh, for those that are only listening the camera only opened the lens uh, the lens cap, basically the cover only opened slightly. It's like a little slit. It'd be like looking under a door uh, at something and you only see just a little slit of the photo of his head and, and the door of Andy's car. Uh, but wow. Uh, what a great story. Almost. I mean, just as a fan, as I said, it just, I'm right there with him as he's telling the story, seeing it happen and thinking, man, did he leave out the other door? Uh, you know, what happened? So, uh, Trey, thank you for letting me share that story again here on Two Chairs 10 years after you told it the first time. Uh, wow. What a <laughs> this, this podcast has been around for a while that we're talking 10 years later. Uh, we're revisiting a similar, the same story, but with more detail. So hopefully you got a little bit more, even if you heard it 10 years ago, because boy, I never have forgotten it. Well, friends, we're back with Randy Turner. He missed the whole month of September because I was out doing the Mayberry Man movie. And so I gave him uh, plenty of time off to rest and relax. And now he is back. And we're going to go hear from him now with this week in Mayberry history. Welcome to This Week in Mayberry History, a report by special correspondent Randy Turner of the Gomer and Cooper Pyle Comic Book Literary Guild of the Mayberry Historical Society. This past Saturday, October the 3rd, 2020, marked the 60th anniversary of the debut of The Andy Griffith Show. But two days earlier, marked the 66th anniversary of the best-selling book that played a pivotal role in making Andy Griffith a household name, No Time for Sergeants. This will be the first of several reports that will trace just how that came to be. Written by Mac Hyman, No Time for Sergeants was released on October the 1st, 1954. Hyman was a student at Duke University when the United States entered World War II. He left school and enlisted in the U.S. Army Air Forces, the aerial combat branch during and immediately after the war. While it was sometimes called simply the Air Force, it was actually a part of the Army 
and was the direct predecessor of today's United States Air Force, now a separate branch of the military. Lieutenant Hyman served as a navigator on B-29s and flew 29 combat missions over Japan. After his service, he returned to Duke and finished his degree. He began writing No Time for Sergeants in 1947, then re-enlisted in the Air Force in 1949. He served another three years. He drew on his own experiences in the Army Air Forces, and after seven years of working on it, the book was finally released in 1954. The novel tells of the experiences of an uneducated country bumpkin named Will Stockdale from Colville, Georgia, a setting inspired by Hyman's hometown of Cordell, located in a rural county south of Atlanta. The book is written in the first person in a southern dialect, with intentional misspellings and poor punctuation to represent Will's strong accent. The novel is filled with examples of the innocent and innately good Will frustrating and overturning the military regimented way of doing things. If one has heard Andy Griffith's monologue recordings, such as What It Was Was Football, when one reads Sergeant's, one can almost hear Griffith's voice as the book's narrator. You can't help but wonder whether Griffith's popular comedy monologues could have also been an influence on Hyman for the voice used by Will as the narrator of the book. Griffith performed his comedy routines in venues throughout the South before his football and Romeo and Juliet routines were released as 45 RPMs. And interestingly, in what it was was football, the narrator has a big orange drink. On the way to Colville, Will Stockdale has a big grape drink. But with the popularity of fruit-flavored knee-high at the time, it could also certainly have been a coincidence. A good example of the language can be seen in the opening pages of the book. As the novel opens, Will and his Paul have just returned from fishing. After describing walking four miles home with his father, and his father then napping on the porch, Will says his dog, Blue, raised his head, perked his ears, and stared at him. He described it, Well, I wouldn't have thought nothing of it if it had been any other dog, but Blue weren't the kind of dog that ever looked puzzled about anything much. I mean, he was one of the smartest dogs I ever seen in my life, and pretty stuck up about it, too. Like when he points a bird for you, he makes out it and weren't nothing for him to do, and acts kind of casual about it and all, and watches you with this real disgusted look on his face. I mean, I don't guess he had ever come right out and showed he was puzzled about anything much before in his life before then. We then learned the car was driven by Mr. McKinney of the local draft board. Four letters had been sent to Will with no response, and McKinney first assumes he will hear the excuse that Will can't read, which infuriates Will's father. Pa insists Will demonstrate he can by reading the Bible. Will describes to the reader that he read to Mr. McKinney about a man named Abraham, even though he was not black, when that name is only one associated with a common name for black men. But he does not use the term black. While it is certainly accurate that an educated backwoodsman in Georgia during that time period used the N-word, it is still disconcerting to modern ears to hear the protagonist use it so easily, especially when Mayberry fans will have been hearing Will's voice as that of Andy Griffith. The offensive word is certainly used in other books, perhaps most notably The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. In Sargent's, Will never speaks disparagingly about black men, but uses the slur more as the term he had been taught. He uses it in a couple of spots in the book, this being the first. We will continue to look at how this book eventually brought Andy to fame next week. So that's it for this week. As always, thanks for listening. Take care of one another. And remember to take Andy's advice and go out there and act like somebody. Uh, thank you, Randy. Thanks for coming back here to the podcast uh, after some time off. It's great to have you. If you want to make sure you don't miss out on any of what Randy's doing on the Internet related to the Andy Griffith Show, 
send him an email at turnersgrade at gmail.com and he'll make sure you don't miss out on anything. Turnersgrade at gmail.com. Thank you, Randy. I really do appreciate it. And uh, great information always. He digs up all kinds of interesting things. Uh, Will Stockdale's dog's name was Blue. You know, just like the dog on the Andy Griffith Show. Coincidence? Mm, I doubt it. It's cool. All right, guys. Uh, that is all I have for us tonight, except I do want to mention that last week, the kind folks here at the podcast gave me some artwork that was uh, of Floyd the Barber. And it was, and, and it says, if you, if you look around, Alan, uh, the, uh, the fellow who actually did the artwork, his name's Alan, and Alan Moser, M O S, and uh, Jan is picking it up and carrying it around behind me. There it is, because we haven't hung it up yet. But uh, it's actually the original artwork. I said last week, I think during the podcast, that it was a print. But you know, because I was surprised, I didn't know, I hadn't had a chance to look at it. But it was just, it was a print. I thought so. Uh, Alan, uh, you know, he he did this great artwork of Floyd the barber, and uh, the folks here on the podcast were kind enough to. Uh, to get that and provide it to me. So thank you again to everybody for that. I, I don't know if I thanked everyone well enough last week because I was kind of surprised at getting it. Uh, but uh, if you hadn't seen it, it's uh, it's pretty cool. I posted it on our Facebook page, so you can go and check it out there. The great work he did, and it's a pencil drawing, and it's the original artwork. So that's cool. I'm not used to actually getting original artwork. I usually get like a print or a picture of it. <laughs> so so thank you to all of you guys uh for uh, helping collect the money and to provide that to me that's really nice I, I just can't thank you enough friends i want to thank you all for sticking around for 600 plus episodes of two chairs no waiting it has been a pleasure it's been uh what 12 years now hopefully we'll stick around a while longer and be able to do this more and more and continue to be able to come up with new ideas and things to talk about here on the podcast, uh, it's it's just uh, it's a lot of fun. Remember to head over to Weavers and check out some of the stuff there. We got several new things over at Weavers, including Weavers T-shirts. <laughs> That's right. If you really love Weavers, you could wear a Weavers T-shirt of your very own, or even a hat. There's caps too. You can get a Weavers cap, uh, and you go over to WeaversDepartmentStore.com and check out all the fun things they got over there. That's a great way to help support the podcast. If you don't, uh, if you don't feel like being a patron or something like that, buying stuff at Weavers uh, keeps me out of trouble with Mrs. Weaver. So definitely do that. So friends, I would love to hear from you. You can give me a call at 888-684-8415, or you can email me at floyd at imayberry.com. I would love to hear from you so that your voice could be right here on the podcast like Trey's was 10 years ago. 10 years ago it's still just it kind of hurts me to realize it's been 10 years since he gave me that voicemail uh, but wow it's been a blessing uh, going from the 50th to the 60th anniversary of the Andy Grover show right here on two chairs so friends thanks again and I'll see you next time right here on two chairs no way good night everybody